All right, folks, welcome back to the Firewood uh, Addicts podcast series. We got a new guest with us today. It's be exciting. Phil, go ahead, go ahead and say, say, say good morning. Morning. Phil is a pro. He's going to share his knowledge with us today, folks. It, it's going to be exciting. Go ahead and enjoy. All right, Phil, um, share with us, where are you calling in from uh, today? I'm calling in from uh, my wonderful three-stall garage. It's an absolute cluster like any typical home shop is. Uh, I'm located in Clear Lake, Wisconsin, which is western Wisconsin, northwestern Wisconsin, however you want to draw the line. I'm about an hour out of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, pretty nice location here, especially for a firewood business. Um, we've got, you know, pretty much everything you need. We've got summer recreational use. We've got winter heating use. Um, we deal with all four seasons. Uh, this spring's been a little on the muddy side, but not horrible. Didn't have much of a winter. So we're, we're, we're making do up here in the North. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's the people that I see on YouTube and their shops or the garage, they're spotless or organized. And and I think think to myself, you have way too much time in your hands. If your shop or garage is organized and spotless, good good God. I mean, get 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 one more hobby in, in your in your <laughs> in your tool belt. I mean, like my garage is a cluster like yours and but mine's almost maybe worse, but it is what it is. I mean, like I have I, I, I I I don't for me to to be outside cutting or bucking or splitting they haven't organized my my girl anyway 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 um oh trust Phil trust Sher- me if if my garage is clean and spotless it's because I'm either getting started on a big project mm-hmm. or I just wrapped up a big project I hear you the other 360 days out of the year you're tripping over something you know <laughs> it, 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 right. It's clean enough if you if you're paying attention to what you're doing. You're going to get around. You're going to find the tools and whatnot that you need. But yeah. it is not a. Uh, th- this is not a garage for TV. This is a garage for radio. <laughs> I hear you saying. I hear you saying. For me, I think the trick is to um, make sure that I put away a tool where I know where it is, where I need to use it next time, and then I can figure it out. But um, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Um, so Phil, what is your, what is your background? Well, without going into it too deep at this point, uh, grew up a farm kid up here in Northern Wisconsin, um, where I'm at, you know, I'm in Polk County. It's a lot of dairy farms around, um, actually within about seven miles of my yard here, I've got three big family run dairy farms. Um, Grew up a farm kid, knew I didn't want to go into farming. Um, for better or worse, I decided instead of finishing high school, go to tech school to become an egg mechanic. You know, didn't want to farm, but I'll take the farmer's money any day of the week. Um, so I've got a two year tech diploma in egg mechanics, working on tractors and stuff. Um, from there, found myself working my way through different weld shops all over Northern Wisconsin, uh, built pontoons for a year, worked for Rice Lake weighing systems. They make uh, survivor truck scales, um, worked in an independent truck shop for a while, wrenching and welding, putting uh, mounted forklift kits on trucks for the most part. Uh, then got into a bigger weld shop, spent over a decade in that bigger weld shop, um, at that point I started doing firewood, you know, just to heat my own place. I bought this place in 2008 and wife and I both kind of wanted a wood stove just for backup and whatnot. Um, yeah, I spent about a decade in the weld shop down in Baldwin and then, uh, was doing firewood on the side and then it just got to the point, left the weld shop and went full time with the firewood stuff. 
you could kind of say I was maybe a little genetically predisposed to getting into the forestry world because on my mom's side of the family, I got uncles and grandpa and great grandparents and stuff. They were in the woods, you know, loggers, log buyers, truckers, what have you. So, I mean, it, it, so there is a little bit of sawdust in the, in the genetics here. So. So then, um, in, before you got heavy into, in the firewood, um, how many cords per year, um, would you burn for your, your own home? Well, I mean, I, I, when I first started, you know, I had just a cheap cast iron pot belly stove in the living room, nothing efficient at all. I mean, the thing is an absolute <laughs> wood hog. And by the time I had grown up working for all the different farmers, I was cutting whatever off the fence lines, whether it be box elder or piss elm or, you know, if I got lucky, I might find two or three eight inch diameter scrub oaks, you know, but it was all low grade hardwoods, you know, nothing, nothing real great. Um, so between the pot belly and the house, and then shortly thereafter, I put a wood stove in the garage, you know, my average winter years ago, I was going through 15 to 20 full quart a year, but it wow. was all, all low grade wood. It was not, so, you know, the pot belly in the living room, somebody was getting up and refilling that thing every couple of hours because you weren't getting any burn time out of it. You know, and mm -hmm. at the time I didn't really care too much because, well, I was getting wood for nothing. Wasn't having to go very far to get it. I mean, one winter I didn't, one winter I never actually hauled any wood home with the, with the truck. I hauled it all home with an old farm tractor because I was just cutting fence lines around a neighbor's field. Mm -hmm. You know, so I didn't, you know, I was going a half a mile to the back corner of that field. It was all the farther I had to go for the stuff. Gotcha. Right on. Um, so how, so tell me how that evolved to heat your own home and getting, getting free, free trees or free, free wood from your neighbors. How did that evolve and how quickly did that evolve to what you do now? Is there like a, like a short story to that or that, that, that long, long story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest with you, it all started on, all started by accident. Okay. Um, when I bought this property in 2008, my, my first wife and I, I told, you know, 2008 real estate market was in the toilet. So, so you didn't have to hurry up and buy a house. And I, I told the, the first wife, I says, look around. I told her, here's, here's how far I want to have to drive to work. I said, I want to be on a on a somewhat main road, either county, state, or fed road. I says, I don't want to be tucked 40 miles off in a toolie someplace to have bad roads driving to work in the wintertime. Well, this property come up, I'm on U.S. Highway 63, which is a very major route from Minneapolis, St. Paul, to what we call cabin country up here in northwestern Wisconsin. Well, by the time I am on a main highway, as my wood pile behind the garage started getting a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger, I'd have just random people pull in on a Friday afternoon and ask if they could buy a load of wood off of me. You know, wow. buy a pickup load of wood. Well, one pickup load this year, three pickup loads the next year, 20 pickup loads the third year, and it just started growing, hmm. you know. Obviously, got to the point, a little more equipment, a little bigger equipment, a little more volume, started buying logs. One thing leads to another. Next thing you know, I'm, as far as I understand from some of the people I've talked to, I've been told I'm, if I'm not the biggest solo firewood producer in North America, I'm at least in the top five. Wow. Wow. Huh. So I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but have you delivered yeah, Go ahead wood? and get ahead of yourself. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm curious just to know, have you delivered wood to, 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 to Chicago yet? I've gotten calls from the Chicago area looking for wholesale loads. Um, part of the problem 
part of the problem with going that far is the logistics end of it. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, like for me, Chicago is about, oh, six, six and a half hours, I suppose, to the northern suburbs. Now, keep in mind, it's Chicago. Chicago, the northern suburbs is the Wisconsin, Illinois state line, you know. Okay. You cross into Illinois, you might as well say you're in Chicago until you get into <laughs> Indiana. Yeah. But, uh, no, I mean, there there are a couple of guys up here over the years that have sent semi-loads of cut and split firewood to Chicago. You know, at this point, that's just, I, I've got enough demand without doing it that I haven't really, you know, haven't really chased that much yet. Gotcha. I ask because from what I understand of the market, that area is there's like no firewood, no trees. It's just like barren land of for, for firewood and people heat with firewood. So people will truck in and deliver cores of firewood and make a lot of money because there's no firewood being sold in that in the area and they would drive hours to do so and get paid very well. I'm just curious if, if you had that uh, yet. Yeah, I'm um, cool. Um, well, and I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in a, I'm kind of in the division between the North woods and the Southern, you know, farming area. You get, you get Southern part of Wisconsin and yeah, there's little pockets here and there of woods, but the commercial forestry industry down there just doesn't really exist. You know, it's a lot of, you know, we, we talk about boutique shops and, you know, in big cities, you know, selling this little product or that little product, whatever, little mom and pop shops selling knickknacks and stuff. That's kind of what the forestry world is down the Southern part of Wisconsin is it's, it's specialty stuff. There isn't the, the large volume stuff going on down there. Um, I do know there's a couple of sizable producers. Um, Madison is about, oh, just over halfway from where I am to Chicago. And I know there's, there's got to be some bigger producers just North of Madison now. Um, they're still, for, from my understanding, most of those guys down there are still doing it on the weekends. You know, yeah, they've got the big equipment and stuff so they can hammer out a pile of wood. <laughs> pile of wood on the weekends but in in the current trucking market you know say i say i get somebody with a walking floor trailer or a big end dump or something like that to haul a semi load down to chicago for me i'm gonna have 1500 to two grand easily just into the trucking to get it down there mm -hmm. and, and i've got enough market without having to truck it down there that all I, you know, the extra I'd be getting paid for it down there would just cover the trucking. So at that point, it doesn't really pencil out. I hear what you're saying. I gotcha. Okay. Let's, let's step back a little bit. Um, let's go with um, where, how are you procuring your logs and how much, um log volume are you going through per year years ago i was doing everything from cut the tree down bring it home everything else um back about 2000 and that would have been 2018 or 2019 i forgot to double check the year on that before we started today but uh we had a big big storm system come through and when I say big storm system, this system did tree damage all the way from parts of eastern Minnesota, hopped and skipped and jumped all the way across Wisconsin, clear over into central Michigan. So over the course of about 10 days there, just in my immediate area, and when I say immediate area, I'm talking within an hour drive. Mm -hmm. Over the course of 10 days, we had seven confirmed EF1, EF2 tornadoes wow. over the course of about a, about a week, week and a half. Wow. Um, and it did, 
it did a number on stuff and it was it was close enough to me that it was cheap and easy to haul the stuff home i mean the the south edge of that storm track was only about 16 17 miles north of me Mm -hmm. so when that went through obviously with people driving by my place on their way to the cabin they called me you know you want to come get this wood or tree services working on cabins we're driving by hey can we dump wood in your yard you know so i got a lot of it that way well then i think it was 2000 and i think it was 2020 the spring of 2020 we were uh we were looking at what was in the yard here every year I was selling out faster and faster and faster. I just couldn't keep up. So I actually had a logger that was working in the area call me and he goes, Hey, you ever buy semi loads of wood? And I said, well, I said, I haven't in the past, but I said, let's, let's talk about this. What are we looking at price wise and whatnot? And he gave me a price and it was, it was something I could work with. Lost a lot of sleep over it, but I bought uh, bought six loads from that logger that first year. Well, that six loads the first year. Second year, I bought, uh, I think I bought 14 or 15 loads from him. Well, I pay cash when the truck shows up. Loggers love getting paid when they deliver because most of the mm-hmm. mills, they got to wait, you know, a month, two months, whatever to get their check. Okay. Well, then I had other loggers calling me. And so that's how everything gets brought in now for the most part is I don't typically have to go looking for it. They call me Mm -hmm. and everything's Mm -hmm. bought, trucked in. Easier for you to have them come to you and deliver versus you going out and having to seek out the, the wood Um, and having to, I mean, there's a cost, I mean, with the ratio of a probability having to pay for wood, but I think there's an argument where if you're even having to pay for wood, but having it come to you, then you're still uh, time t- t- time and money ahead because your money or your time is spent in the yard producing versus out and out out uh, having having to find and then bring in uh, the wood. Um, gotcha, exactly. Gotcha. I mean, there, there's so many guys that'll they'll chase all over the place to pick up quote unquote free wood. Well, it's not free running around picking up wood. You know, I looked at it years ago when I started doing it as a side thing. You know, I figured I had to make just as much per hour doing firewood as I did working overtime at work. You know, because yeah. It's overtime. You know, you're putting in more than your 40 hours a week. And so, I mean, like for me, okay, say I chase the next town over to pick up an eight-foot pickup load of wood. Well, by the time I jump in the truck, run over there, load it up, run back, unload it. Okay, I'm going to have an hour tied up in that. So I'm going to have an hour into that third of a cord, half of a cord, whatever I got on the back of the truck. Mm -hmm. Well. Let's face it, it's not too hard to make 15 to $20 an hour in this day and age. Well, yeah. that's 15 to $20 an hour working your 40. Well, let's call it 20 for easy math. Well, now your overtime rate's 30 bucks. Well, you just put $30 worth of labor into going to get a half quart of wood. You know, that's mm-hmm. not counting gas, wear and tear on a truck, all that stuff. And for me... I'm fortunate enough there's enough excess forest product out there, whether it be pulp logs or whether it be culling oversized, what have you. I rarely have to pay over $100 a cord for hardwoods. Mm -hmm. You know, cherry and hickory and stuff get a little more expensive sometimes, depending on what the market is. But, you know, your your woods run mixed hardwoods, I'm rarely over $100 a cord delivered. So it don't take much to make that math work. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I think there's definitely an argument and the math to to support it where 
buying buying wood and having it be delivered to your 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 yard um works out and having to that that ever chase of a free wood either you find it on marketplace or offer up whatever it just it takes a toll and and it's just not not worth your time i hear you're saying i hear you're saying well and um, i mean the the math of it is one aspect of it i i talk with over the years i've mentored probably two dozen different firewood guys they were you know backyard hobby guys chasing the free wood around what have you they were looking to take that next step and they all well how how, how do i go about getting trucks haul, or getting truckloads of logs hauled in well there's a lot of guys the first thing they got to do is find a spot that they can actually get a truckload of logs in mm -hmm. you know the, these like around me most guys are running uh what they call a center mount self-loader you know it's a 40, 45, 50 foot trailer, whatever, with a log loader in the middle of it, and it's it's a full size semi. Well, they mm -hmm. take some room. They've got to have room to be able to get in, unload, get out, all that stuff. Um, you know, you get out. It, it seems to be most common out in the Northeast as far as self loaders go. These guys running around with just straight trucks. Well, those straight trucks don't take as much room as a semi, but they still need room. Mm -hmm. And some of these guys just flat out do not have the square footage on their property to get a truck that size in. I hear you're saying, you know? yeah, you need to have the space. I mean, one thing for like a dump trailer to back into your yard and dump whatever rounds that they have have there, but for full size poles, logs, you need the space for the driver to literally back in or pull in and able able to offload. And then to pull out and then and leave, um, and then physically it's not if that's not possible. That's not going to happen. So either to yeah. move or to upgrade your your space is definitely key to 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 uh, 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 to expand your operation. Gotcha. Um, in your, do you produce where you live, or do you, do you have a separate property? Um, where you're doing your 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 firewood operation? Nope, everything's right here. I mean, I'm sitting in my shop, garage, whatever you want to call it. The house is right there, um, and I do all my firewood stuff. Years ago, it was all right behind the garage back here, but uh, now it's basically taken over the vast majority of my three and a half acres I've got here. Wow. So then when you you're bringing in logs, um, is it is it so do you bring in logs throughout the year or is it is it only only season to bring in logs in your area uh, depending on the weather? Well, I mean, weather does play a huge, huge factor in it. Obviously, the trucks have got to get it got to be able to get in and out of the woods to to be able to haul it in here um with my location being on a major highway you know if they can get in and out of the woods they can get in and out of here we do have uh here in wisconsin in the winter time we have what they call a frozen road proclamation which that's when the state says yep the frost is deep enough in the ground you can run heavier what have you and in a typical winter, that frozen road proclamation around me will normally come out somewhere mid-January. Some years it'll be earlier in January. Some years it'll be maybe the first week of February. But once that frozen road proclamation comes on, then the log trucks really crank her up to try to get as much hauled as they can because they can haul more per trip. Mm -hmm. Um now, like this last winter, we had a really, really weird winter here. I mean, we had, what did we have? Three and a half, four inches of rain over Christmas. Wow. You know, for, for us, not... for us, Christmas is normally snow up to our, you know, at least yeah. ankle deep, if not knee deep. <laughs> you know, not, not sitting there watching the rain come down, wondering if we were going to have to mow lawn between Christmas and New Year's. but. So by the time we had such a weird winter, 
we had frozen road proclamation didn't come out until I think they finally issued it somewhere around the first of February, but it was such a marginal winter. And then it warmed up right away. We went from frozen road to spring road restrictions. Um, oh. and, that, and there were some counties, they went from frozen road to spring weight restrictions in under two weeks. Wow. Um, spring weight restrictions, you know, when the ground is thawing out up here, these guys are basically shut down. Um, most of the town roads and stuff, they only allow six ton per axle in weight going down a lot of those roads. And we've got roads around that are six ton roads year round. So once we get to that spring weight restriction time, they call that breakup. because the ground's breaking up. Basically that shuts down the log hauling from the time that comes on. To some years, that spring weight restriction doesn't come off until mid-May. Well, so there's, you know, typical year, that's April and May. There's no trucking going on. Um, then we also have oak wilt restrictions where they can't haul out of certain areas. So if the loggers I'm normally working with are working in an oak wilt restricted area, they can't truck out of there until the middle of July. Okay. So as far as me getting logs hauled in here, yeah, I've got guys that, that haul in here basically year round just because they're in areas where they can do it. Um, but typically my logs start coming in mid July, end of July, I'll buy, you know, about 25, maybe 30% of my annual inventory from July to about September. Well, then September to November, most of the trucks are hauling a load here, load there to all these guys that buy a semi load for their own use. Well, then they start trucking in here again. Oh, a lot of times they'll start trucking in here right before Christmas or right after Christmas. And then they, they haul in here. Basically by then it's anytime you got time to haul in here, bring, bring wood in and clear through mm -hmm. until stuff gets too muddy in the spring. Gotcha. Um, interesting. Interesting. Is there, is there a time or in your yard, is there, is there always poles stacked ready to go? Or is there, is there a time or has, the, or has there been a time where you were super low on inventory and you were scared that you were running out to process? I have had something in the yard to process nonstop or continuously since the spring of what was that spring of 2020 okay. so for the last four years, there's always been something here to work on. Um, prior to that, there were times here and there where I had stuff, you know, I, I, I would have been down to, you know, a couple of weeks from when I finished up what I had on hand to when I started on, you know, when I got more stuff in, um, as far as big gaps of not having something to work on, basically that goes back to when I was, you know, cutting everything myself and just doing it as a side thing, doing, you know, maybe five, 10 quarter a year for sale. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, let's go with this. And so I've, so obviously you have ash in your area, but what is the, the, the biggest species that you're getting most of um, in your yard? There really isn't one particular species that I necessarily get more of than another. Um, now, that being said, I, I, I've got a market for anything that grows around here. You know, so there, I do offer several different sorts, blends, mixes, however you want to put it. Um, most years I'll buy roughly 50, 50 for my heating wood stuff. I'll buy half of my inventory is going to be, you know, straight loads of Oak. You know, mm -hmm. I'm in an area where we've got red Oak, white Oak, um, a little bit of pin Oak, a little bit of burr Oak. 
um, technically pin oak would fall into the red oak side and bur oak falls into the white oak side, but that's an argument for another day. Um, but like my mixed hardwood loads, that's going to be ash and maple and some birch and occasionally I, I've got one logger I work with. He normally puts the oak right in with the mixed hardwood piles just because he don't, he don't have enough people that are looking just for oak loads. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, and that's, like I said, that's just my heating type customers. Um, this time, well, in the spring of the year, a lot of time right after breakup, you know, as soon as conditions get good enough, that they start trucking again. I'll buy a lot of pine and basswood and aspen because that's my campfire wood. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my summer customers, most of them don't want to sit around a fire that, you know, just kind of nice low flame, you know, they don't want to sit around a real hot fire for eight, 10, 12 hours. <laughs> you know, they want something that gives them a nice bright flame. They sit around it for a couple hours and they go to bed. Yeah. You know, so that's where those kind of low grade hardwoods and the softwoods, that's where all that stuff goes. So, you know, if if I actually went back and looked at all my truck slips and stuff, I would say I've probably bought more oak than anything else over the years, but it's not it's not that I specifically target buying certain species, you know, regularly. Gotcha. Is there is there a species that if a logger has um, a whole load of one species that and they're saying they call you on the phone and say, hey, Phil, do you want this load? And you're like, I'm not taking that. And there's no there's no way. The only time I'll turn down a load from the logger is when I don't physically have a place to put it. Mm-hmm. OK, you know, there there's. I've come to realize that, I mean, granted, there are certain times where they want more money than it's worth when it's all said and done, but I've got a market for everything. You know, there, there really isn't something that I, like I said, there's nothing I really turn down unless the the math on it doesn't work or I don't physically have a spot to put it. Mm Mm-hmm. You're saying I I have found that I mean I'm not definitely not I I'm not at your level at all, but even even for myself selling firewood, I have found where I can sell pretty much any type of wood, any species, and have that still be profitable. Um, it's just having to find a market for it. Um, to to uh, uh, to sell. Um, interesting. Um, well, and uh, to, to expand on that a little bit, I mean, there are guys that are in markets where certain stuff just doesn't sell, mm-hmm. you know, but the, those markets are typically your kind of ultra high end focus more on the recreational users, you know, um, I've come to find that I've got high-end customers down in the metro that they wouldn't even consider burning pine in their fire pit down there. Their cabin out here, guess what they want? They want a whole load of pine. (laughs) But some of that is more... Here, Here in the upper Midwest, I swear to God, we have got the worst wood snobs in the world. You know, there are so many people up here that, oh, I got to have oak. 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 Well, fine then. You insist on having oak. Guess what you're going to get? You're going to get oak. You're also going to pay for it. Mm. You know, I've got, I get customers calling me all the time. They insist they want three year seasoned oak. And I look at them and I go, well, good luck. Because honestly, in my climate, it doesn't take that long to dry oak. Now, if you're taking an eight-inch round, cracking it in half, leaving it heap, heaped in a pile in a low spot out in the woods, yeah, that it's never going to dry. Mm-hmm. 
but you take it down to a nice small fireplace size product. I mean, I was splitting stuff. I, I'm I'm not kidding. I was splitting stuff on Tuesday. I know it's going to be ready by October. And we're not really? talking little. Okay. We're not talking little stuff. We're talking. I was splitting up stuff that before I ran it across the splitter. Some of that stuff was chunked up into six and eight and ten chunks, and it was still grunting a little bit to put it on a splitter. Huh. And so, maybe I don't want to fast forward myself too 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 far. Are you obviously when you're when you're processing, you it's going to a big pile, right? You're not you're not stacking it, I assume. I don't stack unless the customer pays me to stack. The exclusion being I got a couple little old ladies here in town that have been with me forever, have never complained about my price increases, and typically send me home with some cookies or, you know, muffins or loaf of bread fresh out of the oven or something, you know. It's it's extremely rare that I stack anything. Gotcha. I mean, heck, so I, have... I, I even put a I even put a double door in right next to my pot belly stove in the living room so that I can uh, just bring an IBC tote up to the house with the tractor and just set it right in the house. There you go. There you go. Um, so then, therefore, in your yard, you have several mountains of firewood just 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 just, just they're 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 drying out. I assume, right? Yep. My mountains of firewood turn more into great big windrows. Um, the way I set up the process, I've got, I've now got two FC32 Wolf Ridge firewood conveyors. So what I'll do is I'll put, put that conveyor at a little bit of an angle off the log pile. And as I work through my log pile, I just pivot that conveyor on the wheels. So then I'm making a big windrow that where I am, prevailing winds, typically out of the west. So I run my windrows north and south. So they're getting that full wind coming out of the west. Well, then add to that, I've got enough slope to my yard that the next windrow back is still getting good wind because the base of that windrow is higher than the windrow in front of it. Mm -hmm. gotcha. you know? So, I mean, it, it it's... It's trial and error, and big piles like I do don't work everywhere. You know, like for for guys out west like you are, you know, obviously there's a lot of parts of Washington, Oregon, Northern California, the annual rainfall just doesn't allow for big piles like that. It would be completely mm -hmm. rotten long before it ever dries out. You know, um, guys down louisiana mississippi you know that that humid coastal gulf climate it doesn't work now guy guy in arizona or new mexico or parts of nevada or eastern washington or oregon where it's you know mm -hmm. high high desert pile away your only problem is going to be the critters <laughs> you know but i mean that's just it, it, that's trial and error stuff. I've always been one. I've never, I've never drank the Kool Aid, you know, for lack of better term. Um, when somebody says, "Well, you can't do it that way," okay, I can't do it that way, or you can't do it that way. There's a difference there, and I mean that's where I've, I've learned some of this stuff by trial and error. I've had a couple of years. I threw away an awful lot of nasty looking moldy rotten wood. Well, I didn't throw it away. I threw it in my own stove, but you know, it, it, it takes a little bit to figure out a system that works for a guy. Um, getting back to back to guys I've mentored over the years and whatnot, you know, I'll, I'll typically give them kind of just some generic ideas to run with, you know, I, I'm I'm one of these guys I I haven't forgotten my struggles ten years ago. You know, so I'm trying to help some of these guys save themselves a lot of headache, a lot of hassle, and typically a lot of money. But it still comes down to okay, you need to do some of the legwork yourself. This is what you need to try to see if this is gonna work before you go eyeballs deep in something to find out it don't work mm -hmm. on yeah. that 
No, Go not ahead. Phil. Um, um, is there a trend or is there like one or two tips that you have that, that you recall that you've given to to um, people newer to the industry of um, uh, based on your experience that you can uh, uh, share with us? Well, I mean, narrowing it down to, to one or two is kind of tough, but, you know, one of the biggest things I see a lot of guys doing is, especially guys that are trying to, you know, they're, they're, they're what I would group as hobbyist firewood guys, you know, the guy doing five, 10, 15, maybe 20 cord in his backyard, you know, he, he's working with what he's got, you know, and it's, it's more of a hobby to him. But he's getting to that point where he's starting to look at, okay, how do I turn this hobby into a business? You know, and like right now, the big trend I'm seeing everybody jumping on is the mini split, micro split, tabletop fire pit wood. Mm -hmm. If you're in a metro area, go for it. Give it a shot. I mean, your per volume margins on that stuff is freaking ridiculous. You know, you look on Amazon, it's like 35, 40 bucks for a half a cubic foot. You yeah, know, it's crazy. nuts, mm -hmm. but I, I, I see so many of these guys jumping on what I look at as, as fads, you know, okay. You want to jump on this fad or that fad or the other fad, fine and dandy, give it a shot, but be cautious how much you're investing in that because that market might not be here next year or the year after, you know, when you're looking at how to grow from a hobby to a business, you need to look at, okay, what has, what market stays true in my area year in and year out. And you mm -hmm. kind of have to gear yourself towards that as at minimum a fallback. You know, for me up here, heating wood and campfires, Every year, people go camp and have campfires. Every year, it gets cold, so people are heating their houses. So that that heating wood market in the fall and in the winter, and then that campfire market over the summer, you know, those are my, those are really my bread and butter. Is there money in it? Eh, some days. For the most part, though, I mean that's low margin product that every Tom, Dick, and Harry that does firewood as a hobby makes that stuff mm -hmm. you know the the specialty stuff you know the bagged wood the bundles the hickory and cherry and white oak and whatnot for the smoker guys or if you're down south it's mesquite and pecan and all that or I'm guessing out by you it's probably a little bit of maple thrown into the mix you know mm -hmm. just because that's what's you know available mm -hmm. um you know that stuff it's pretty easy to tie a lot of money into that inventory. You know, I had a load of hickory come in the other week. I think I was $2,200 for a load of hickory when a load of mixed hardwoods is less than half that. Wow. You know, so you, you've just got to kind of weigh your options. You've got to bank on those tried and true markets that have been there. Um, one of the other things I tell a lot of guys is I, I see a lot of guys and a lot of, I've had a handful of YouTube guys over the years reach out to me. Well, these guys sit and watch the videos, all the big fancy equipment, you know, whether it be the, the big Easton made processor, the big bells processor, the big multi techs, you know, all that, all that big equipment, you know, that's a hell of an investment. You know, it's, it, it's, it's not a bad idea if you have, the markets, the margins, the volumes, what have you to invest in that, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think it's about, been about two years ago. Now I actually spent a lot of time talking with Andrew Easton about a 60 C, but after I talked to him and Skidder Kev and a couple other guys, I know that have been around the big processors, we came to the conclusion that with what I'm doing, they're just not, you're not going to see the production out of them. You're not going to mm -hmm. see, you're not going to see the return on it. So, I mean, a lot of these guys, they get kind of starstruck by the big shiny equipment and fine and dandy go for it. If you can, if you, if the numbers work, go for it. 
but I tell these guys, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that would drastically improve your efficiency without spending 200,000 bucks to do it. I gotcha. You know, the guy guys delivering with a pickup, one of the biggest things I could tell them from personal experience that makes a huge difference, go buy one of them load handler belt systems. Cost you 200 bucks. And you know what? Three quarters of the wood in the back of your truck is going to come out with the turn of a crank. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to go from spending 15, 20 minutes pitching a pickup load of wood off of the customers to five minutes, you got your money down the road to go. Mm-hmm. Done. You know, these guys that, oh, got to get a dump trailer, got to get a dump trailer, got to get a dump trailer. Fine and dandy. Go out and spend 10 grand on a, on a good tandem axle dump trailer. But don't complain to me because you can't back the thing into wherever you got to deliver it. <laughs> I honestly don't even own a dump trailer anymore. I got okay. rid of my dump trailer a year and a half ago because it just sat around the yard. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, there was a time where it made sense for me to have a dump trailer. But is that the best way to do it? God, no. You know, if you're... If you're in a market where people are buying it by the third cord, face cord, Rick, rank, whatever made up name they want to call it, you know, if, if you're in a market where that's all you're ever selling is a third quarter at a time, you don't even need a one ton pickup. Yeah. Run around with your half ton skirt, skirt around with your half ton. There's a hell of a lot less DOT paperwork to deal with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you've got to really look at what makes sense not not what you know the new big shiny whatever is gotcha gotcha as as i took delivery of a brand new skid steer that was eighty thousand bucks 10 days ago oh wow geez geez um let's um let's backpedal a second um can you share with us how many cords how many cords per year do you um, do you sell throughout one one full full year? I'm curious. Well, I mean the the thing with the cord count, you know, I got I was in a position that when COVID hit, and the firewood industry as a whole saw this exponential growth. I was in a position where I could very quickly scale up to meet that demand. So like for me, Oh, I think it was what? 21 or 22. I did almost a thousand cord that year. Wow. You know, but now things have settled back down. You know, people are, things have settled down and the market has started to actually take a downward turn just because you know in my area money's getting tight for a lot of people you know the heating wood market has has cooled off a little bit because propane got cheap again Mm -hmm. um propane is by far our our kind of number one heat source out here you know we're rural enough it's it's almost impossible to have natural gas piped to every house um, pretty much all the towns now have natural gas. So people use natural gas, what have you, but propane mm-hmm. is still kind of our, our number one indicator on heating costs. Um, and like this spring here, I'm hearing a lot of dollar thirty, dollar forty, dollar fifty summer fill pricing on propane. Well, if you do the math and figure out the BTU conversion, all that happy crap, that comes out to about $300 cord firewood, you know, give or take. Depends on efficiency of your wood burner and all that stuff. But, Mm -hmm. you know, so with with cheap propane, um, Memorial Day weekend up here, typically Memorial Day weekend traffic going by my house, it's bumper to bumper 35, 40 mile an hour. And this is a 55 mile an hour road that they're normally doing 70 on. You know, it's just there's that much traffic normally. Um, We had kind of lousy weather. You know, the forecast kept going back and forth between rain and stuff. It was windy. It wasn't wasn't a great weekend. So sales numbers for campers was down. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen a trend the last two years. People are buying in smaller quantities. They're buying, you know, enough to get them by for now, which tells me money's getting tight for people. Mm-hmm. Um, 
last year I did, uh, the heck did I finish a year out at just, just short of 600 cord last year. So, I mean, I've seen stuff drop off pretty drastically. Um, the nice thing is I've, I've been in this game long enough. I know how this cycle goes. You know, last year did 600 cord. This year I'm expecting probably somewhere in that three to 400 cord range because there is a lot of holdover wood from last winter by the time it was mild. Now, what that's going to do for me, you know, guys just starting out, guys doing it as a hobby, they're going to get tired of it. They're going to give her up. They're going to, they're going to say, I'm done with it. So we're going to see this two, three year downward trend. Guys are going to get out of doing firewood. So in another two, three years, we're going to start seeing it climbing again. Well, that, that climb, if that climb follows a typical trend, we'll see about three, four, five years of it growing again. Well, by about year four or five, the hobby cutters are going to come back into the equation and they're going to start, you know, put some more wood out there, you know, so then it's going to level off. What, what COVID did, at least in my market, when COVID hit, we were just starting to climb back up again, just with the normal cycles of the ups and downs of the firewood world. Well, COVID mm -hmm. hits, now everybody's sitting at home. They're having backyard campfires four or five nights a week as opposed to one or two. You know, people working from home, they're using that fireplace all day, every day of the week because they're home to mm -hmm. use it. You mm -hmm. know, so that put just an exponential amount of demand into my market. And I... I was in the right spot at the right time growth wise with the business that I could meet it, you know, but then you also had every Tom, Dick and Harry bored out of their mind. Hey, I got a chainsaw and a, and a log splitter. I'm going to start making firewood and sell firewood. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's just the way the industry cycles. You know, I I've had so many guys go, well, I've been at this for three years now. Well, good for you. Three years. You're, you're, you're starting to get a few things figured out. You got a long way to go before you got her all figured out. Gotcha. Um, so then how long would you say that you have been in this business? As far as the selling firewood goes, I've been selling firewood basically since 2009, 2010, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, as far as, you know, cutting firewood used to help friends, Parents cut firewood in the fall back when I was in high school. That would have been late 90s, early 2000s. Um, some of my first experiences, first hand, hand in the woods. One of the girls I kind of had a crush on when I was in junior high, her dad was working as a logger. Well, he'd take me out in the woods with him. I, I was his grunt out in the woods so that I wasn't uh, fooling around with his daughter while he was out in the woods. <laughs> you know so i mean that goes back you know we go back that far i've got you know close to 30 years in this business one way or another mm -hmm. gotcha are you are you the type of person where you're driving down the road and you see a tree that have has uh, um a fallen down or like a dead or a um the dead, dead or a dead standing uh tree in someone's property and you and drive by and you say that 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 tree should be in my yard or you because you do it uh, professionally and that's your your job and doing it for so long that you don't think about it when you're not working well for starters what's this not working thing you mentioned i mean <laughs> is that something normal people do because i mean <laughs> well you know like we were talking before off camera, you know, you, there's a two hour time difference between us here. So, you know, I, I'm drinking my coffee. It's uh, uh, 930 my time. You're drinking your coffee at 730 your time. You know, I, I first thing I do when I get up in the morning is, OK, we got to clear all the freaking notifications. OK, I got half a dozen yahoos want to join some firewood group I'm in charge of. And 
half a dozen emails from this, that, or the other thing business related. You know, my, my work day starts when I pour my first cup of coffee in the morning and, you know, I got a bun coffee pot, so it's only five, six minutes from the time I get up until I'm pouring my first cup of coffee. And then, you know, being in this business, you know, when do people have time to contact you about your product? You know, it's in the evenings when they're off of work or on the weekends when they're off of work or what have you. So there's a lot of nights I'm still responding to messages, emails, what have you, seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. You know, mm -hmm. um, as far as the driving by and seeing a dead tree in somebody's yard, I, I'll, I'll still notice them. But half the time I go, yeah, I want nothing to do with that. I, I, I do not want anything to do with the liability of that stupid thing landing in the road, landing on their house. I, I did tree removals years ago. I, I had, you know, all the insurance and everything for doing tree removals. I had times I had flaggers out there and closed down roads because we knew no matter which way the tree fell, there was going to be debris flying into the road, you know. I had I had trees that were over houses, so it was one piece at a time for a 40-foot tall tree. You know, lop it off in the man basket, swing the man lift over, and toss it off out in the yard. I, I, I have no desire to do that anymore. You know, do I miss cutting trees down? Yeah, occasionally. And every now and again, I'll, you know, one in my yard or... Some of the farmers I know, you know, they got one hanging over a field somewhere. You know, I'll, I'll still go cut tree down here or there, but I have no desire to to do that on a regular basis in a professional capacity anymore. Mm -hmm. I got you. I ask in terms of, do you think about firewood when you're about ready to fall asleep, or when you do have the the off off time? Are you still thinking about it, or because you do it do it um, for a living, you you don't want to think about it at times? Oh, there's definitely times I don't want to think about it. Um, <laughs> you know, there you, you get to a point though where, like like right now, you know, I'm I'm getting to that age where I've got to start looking at okay, how do I transition out of production firewood um i've had two knee surgeries i've had issues with my shoulders for years you know i've always worked manual labor intensive type jobs um so i mean my body's pretty well shot i have invested in a lot of equipment that takes most of the manual labor out of it. But at the end of the day, you still got to climb in and out of a machine, climb in and out of a truck to run deliveries, what have you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are definitely times I, I'd like to be able to shut it off. But at the end of the day, I've been doing it for so long and it's been so much of a part of my life for so long. It's not like flipping a switch. It's not like the factory gig in town where you clock out you go home you have a few beverages around a campfire and you don't think about work until tomorrow morning or monday mm -hmm. morning or whatever you know it, it it's at this scale it becomes more who you are you know it, it's people in town know me as the guy south of town with all the firewood you know people in neighboring towns oh yeah that's that guy south of clear lake with all the firewood you know, it, it, it's, it's become as much of, I, I, I've become, you know, it, it, it's firewood fill, it's fill the wood guy, it's, you know, that's what I've become to so many people in the area that you don't just shut it off, you know, you, you go to, you know, I like going to a tractor pull every now and again. You know, that's something that you guys out west might not understand too well. But, <laughs> you know, that that's us good old farm boys. That's what we do for fun. We hook a tractor to a big semi-trailer and see who could pull it further or fastest or whatever. You know, lots of smoke and some beer gets drank and we tell lies and what have you. But, you know, that when I go to a tractor pull, 
I can't sit through a tractor pull without somebody asking me how the firewood business is going or somebody going, Hey, I got to stop by. You're going to be around next weekend. I got to pick up a load of wood or, you know, you, you get to a point where you can try to turn it off all you want, but people don't let you, you mm-hmm. know, for, for, for me, the, the kind of uh, exit strategy, so to speak, you know, and I've already put it out there in, in certain circles, you know, the, the plan, the plan for me here is probably a couple more years and I'll be done with the production side of it. But I've had enough guys reach out that basically want me to come in and do a deep dive into how their operation is currently running. I'll basically become a consultant, you know, just like the big businesses use, you know, big businesses use consultants all the time. Mm hmm. And, and there's there's becoming a trend with some of these producers that they they don't want to learn it the expensive way like I did. You know, over the years, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment that just didn't make sense after I bought it. You know, these guys mm. would rather, you know, hire me to come out and tell them, no, don't go buy that $150,000 machine. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm going to be doing more of is I'm going to be doing both, both design and construction, not so much on the construction end, but custom built wood fired kilns for guys. Okay. Because you know, by the, by the time I've proven the theory works, I've actually got one currently certified with the state of Wisconsin. And we'll be getting that one certified with uh, USDA probably later this year, early next year. You know, guy, I've got the I've got the validation that it works, and guys are looking at it, going, "That's a great idea." I can't justify a, a seventy, eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollar commercial built kiln, but I can do five or six thousand dollars for a little kiln, or I can do ten thousand dollars for a little kiln. And by heating with wood, well, there you've got a got a way to get rid of your slash, your culls, your mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, so so that's going to be that could be a whole episode in and of itself. You know, us talking about the kilns, but mm-hmm. you know, that that's where I'll be getting out of the production end of firewood. But I'm not going to be getting out of the industry. I'll be able to turn off firewood the day after my funeral. I got you. It's in your blood already. I hear you. I hear you. I don't think or I, that I know of someone with the title of firewood consultant. I think that would be a cool niche for you at, as you segue into the manual labor side into something that you're still involved in the firewood industry but to travel around and be hired by these different um, yards to help them out. Kind of like on TV, they have those like people who come into their restaurant and they tell them how they're doing it wrong or whatever, but you're going to come oh, in trust and say, me, I'm, wor- I, I, I'm working on pitching the idea to the discovery channel. So I get, you know, a, a brand new pickup and a fancy show on top of it. You know, there you I'll, go. I'll, I'll be, there- I'll be Phil's firewood rescue uh, as opposed to bar rescue or mine rescue. Or- <laughs> No, I mean, it's it's one of those things that years ago, and I mean, for the most part, in most markets, firewood is is a hobby. It's a it's a side hustle. It's a, you know, beer money or the, you know, the bigger firewood groups. We always talk about the beer money Bobbies or the tweaker Tommies, you know, selling cheap, nasty firewood. Well, you know, historically, that's, that was your average firewood producer. It was a guy doing it on the weekends or it was a construction worker laid off for the winter. You know, that is the majority of the firewood production in this country. Mm-hmm. Now, over the last, I would say the last decade, we're starting to see more and more firewood businesses, you know, legitimate businesses. Guys are, you know, whether it's, you know, there's still a lot of guys running a legitimate firewood business on the weekends. 
you know, and that's like, like one of the Facebook groups I started North American firewood pros, you know, the goal for that group was not just to be the big guys, you know, we're not gonna, you know, there was a group a couple of years ago, they tried to get started, you know, it was geared towards guys doing a thousand cord of wood a year or better, or guys doing, I think it was like 20,000 bundles a year or some deal on the bundle side. Well, that group never took off because it was limited to the upper 1% of the whole industry. And the guy that kind of launched that group, he was a bit of an asshole. I mean, I'll admit I'm, I'm a bit of an asshole too. Just ask half the guys I've pissed off over the years. But, you know, North American Firewood Pros, I started that group in the effort to be inclusive, no matter on volume. You know, you want to do 50 cord a year, but you do it as a professional, you're more than welcome. You want to do five cord a year, but you do it as a professional. You know, it, it's not for the, I, I mean, prime example, some of these YouTube guys. I watch some of these videos and I go, how in the hell have you not cut off your leg or dropped a tree on yourself yet? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not for, it's not for the guys that are more interested in making YouTube content than making firewood. It, it's for mm -hmm. the guys that are, are looking to build a business, grow a business, what have you, you know, and those are the ones that, you know, the guys that get into a hundred quarter a year, isn't that hard. 100 cord a year, if you're making good firewood, it's pretty easy to do that. You know, that doesn't take a whole hell of a lot other than, you know, little work ethic and, you know, being honest with your customer. Mm -hmm. It's the guys that are, it's the guys that have seemed to find themselves at a ceiling, you know, somewhere, whether it be 100 cord, 200 cord, 300 cord a year, where they just can't figure out that next step. You know, okay, how do I... I've done this volume now for three, four years. I just can't seem to get more produced or I just can't seem to get more sold. You know, that's the customer that I think would really value from my experience in the industry. And that's the customer I think that would hire me to come in. Interesting. Cool. What do you think that you would market yourself to the, the, the manufacturers of splitters and processors too? Well, I mean, obviously I've got my Wolf Ridge hat, my Wolf Ridge coffee cup, my Wolf Ridge t-shirt. You know, I, I've, I've worked a lot with Chris down there at Wolf Ridge, partially because, I mean, my background between the mechanics and the welding and fabricating, you know, I can, I can make recommendations based on my previous experience. And based on what I'm seeing with the equipment I'm running, you know, hey, can you, get, you know, maybe look at tweaking this a little bit. It wouldn't be that big of a deal to change this, mm -hmm. you know. Um, would I be willing to work with other manufacturers? Of course I would. But I'm also the type of guy that I'm happy to work with a manufacturer as long as, I'm not just there wasting time giving them recommendations and they go, no, we're just going to keep doing it the way we've always done it. You know, mm -hmm. there's got to be a little give or give and take there. Now, yeah, there are lots of guys out there that whether it be in comments on Facebook or whatever, you know, oh, they need to change this. Dude, you realize what it would take to actually change that? You know, we're not talking about some can crusher somebody built in high school weld shop here we're talking you know sizable equipment with engineering and product liability insurance and yada yada and so on and so forth mm -hmm. so i mean i understand the use of it on the firewood side as well as the manufacturing production mechanics of it from the manufacturer standpoint you know and i think that's i think that's something that chris and Bob and I keep I, I always forget the engineer's name down there. I think that's something that those guys see is that hey, Phil's a good guy to work with. Not necessarily that our product is getting that much more exposure, but he can look at it and go, okay, this is what it's doing. How can we 
fix this or minimize this or whatever without having to take our current designs, throw them in the garbage can and start over from scratch. The note of Wolf Ridge, I think that Chris and the, his team has done very well over the last year or so in expanding operations and their um their not appearance their um market into more of the of north america having their new their new um what do i say dealership dealer How yeah they just it? got anyway. they, they just they just started a or just start just delivered to a dealer out what uh oregon if I remember yeah, right. it's in Southern Oregon. So it's basically like smack dab in the middle of the West Coast. So in theory, they could they they could now offer splitters in their equipment um through the entire West West Coast now. Yeah. Whereas other uh, other uh, other um uh, companies like p- perhaps um Eastern Made, that's the more or less on the the east coast and midwest where i can't there's there's no access to that where i'm at um sadly well and i'll i i will say you know the the last well when they bring bob nelson on board down there at wolf ridge that must have been six months ago a year ago eh, about a year ago i suppose now you know, Bob, Bob, by the time he was with Metza for so many years, he's got mm-hmm. more of that kind of broader scope of things. Now, now keep in mind, it wasn't that many years ago. Chris was still building, spl- Chris was building splitters in his garage at home. You know, so, so the growth he has seen has been phenomenal. And I think now with Bob on board to be that, that bigger picture guy, I mean, I'm sure Chris has always kind of had that bigger picture in the back of his mind, mm-hmm. but Bob's actually, you know, kind of, kind of been there, kind of done that, you know, so he, he's got a little better idea how to do it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I tell guys all the time, you know, if you're doing 50 court a year on a firewood operation, quit watching YouTube videos of guys doing 50 court a year. If you think that's going to teach you how to grow your business, you'll, mm-hmm. you'll never learn how to, how to build a million dollar company from somebody that's only built a thousand dollar company, you know, you've got to bring in some outside, whether it be a consultant or whether you hire somebody in or what have you, you've got to bring somebody in that knows how to get from where you are to where you're looking to go. Mm -hmm. Um, Wolf Ridge with their dealer network, it definitely does work very well for them as far as like the East coast stuff. You know, there's an awful lot of firewood equipment that is built here in the upper Midwest, whether it be Minnesota, Wisconsin, or Michigan. You know, you've got multi-tech, you've got brute force, you've got Wolf Ridge, you've got Dana, you've got Halverson. All these manufacturers are right here in the upper Midwest. Mm -hmm. You know, and the ones that are, that see the growth are the ones that have, you know, decided, okay, yeah, we're going to do, do some dealers. We're going to, you know figure out because there's a lot of guys buying this equipment that personally don't know how to work on the stuff. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, some of this stuff is so one-off and specialized. Yeah. The big processors all run Kubota or cat or deer engines, what have you. So you can call a service tech that's going to know how to work on that engine. You know, a lot of hydraulic stuff is, is fairly, standard stuff so to speak in the world of commercial industrial hydraulics but Mm -hmm. now you get into some of the valving or some of the some of the troubleshooting stuff you know that's getting a little more specialized you get in these big processors now you're getting into all the electronics that are that are specialized you know i've got a halverson processor on a skid steer that's actually the only video i've got on my youtube channel is me running the halverson for about two and a half minutes but uh, that Halverson even has a computer in it. Well, that computer is not something that I can call a mobile service tech to come work on. That's not something I can work on. That's mm-hmm. something I've got to contact Halverson to work on or one of their dealers. Um, and I mean, 
dealer networks are kind of a double-edged sword you know like we were talking before off camera chainsaws around me every town's got at least one if not two if not three different places that are supposedly still dealers now some of the mom and pop hardware stores phenomenal service after the sale you know they've got a guy working in the back room he's probably 75 years old smoking a pipe and you know well bring it over here let's see what you got <laughs> you know they they can work on this stuff but there's also a lot of dealers out there they sell it to you wish you well hope you don't break it because we don't know how to fix it <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and so i mean i can understand both sides of the coin you know i can understand andrew's reservation about establishing a dealer network because okay it takes months to make sure that dealer is actually going to be able to service the product they're selling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um most of the dealers that i've talked to that are wolf ridge dealers because i've talked to a few of them you know in passing and whatnot in different groups you know most of these guys seem to have a very good general understanding of the equipment they have if not in-house they have local resources to do some of the repair work some of the service work but at the end of the day there is still certain things that well it's got to come from eau claire you're going to wait a few days for parts whatever mm -hmm. um so i mean it it is really a double-edged sword they've got from the manufacturer side of things, they've really got to make sure that they've got a good dealer or it's not going to, it's only going to hurt them. Gotcha. No, that's, that's half the reason I run what equipment I do is because the dealers I buy from are good servicing dealers. Interesting. I think Andrew touched upon that when I interviewed him about not expanding and he's content, at least then, um, not expanding his, his outreach. But definitely, I mean, it doesn't hurt his operation or his, his market to not be more available on the west side of, of North America. But, um, huh, yeah. Definitely in terms of, like, dealerships in any equipment, you usually will tend to run what, you have available to you in your proximity and or how a a dealer or shop that is near you where they can service your equipment for you not that not have to drive too far away to fix your processor your splitter your chainsaw whatever else um yeah yeah, yeah gotcha as we just segue fun. back um when you are selling your firewood is it to companies to to then resell or or is it to homeowners um and then when you sell is it per is it usually like per cord or do you sell um like like five cords at a time i'm curious well for me the vast majority of my sales is direct to consumer you know whether it be you know somebody heading to the cab and somebody's main home in the you know wherever um so yeah the majority of my sales is direct to consumer now that being said i do wholesale both bulk or pallets of cubic foot bags um i've got a couple of different stores i supply you know small quantities as their their retail racks you know run low um, I've got a couple of bigger outfits. They'll they'll order four or five, six pallets of bagged wood at a crack, you know. So I do have a pretty good mix of wholesale and retail customers. Um, I don't service a whole lot of restaurants with the smoking and cooking woods, just because of the fact that that market is so cutthroat sometimes that you might supply this restaurant for a year. Well, the next year somebody comes in there, they're five bucks cheaper or whatever. Well, they switch. Um, mm -hmm. Just like the big retail chains with the bagged wood, 
you know, I, I'm sure out by you, you see the same brand of bundles at any, at, at all the big retail chains, you know, they, they're again, they're looking for the cheapest supplier for the minimum quality product to leave them the most, po po the most possible product markup, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't have any desire to go after that because for years I've told guys, quit trying to play the race to the bottom a and your big chain stores, that's just the race to the bottom on a massive scale. You know, when you're talking two cents on a million units, that adds up. You know, so I, I stick to like my retail locations that, that buy from me. You know, I stick to the, the mom and pop shops, the independents, the small chains. You know, I've been fortunate over the years. I have never had to cold call a wholesale customer. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I, I've, I've toyed around with the idea. I've, I've even played around with putting together a little flyer, take a day and just drive around, drop off flyers at all these little gas stations. But mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough. I've never, never been in a position where I had to do that to drum up sales. Mm -hmm. Um, the, as far as volumes that I'm selling direct to consumers, you know, for, for people that stop in here and pick up wood, I, I do a lot of the IBC tote stuff. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people, they get an IBC tote, they rip the liner out and then they toss the liner on a burn pile when, a, when it's raining one night. So people don't see the black smoke or pay to get rid of them or whatever. Well, for me, I cut the tops out of the IBC totes, fill them full of wood and down the road they go. You know, the, the liners hold wood just fine. Mm -hmm. And they work great for a lot of my recreational cabin customers because that, that total wood, we can just set that right in the back of their pickup, right on their trailer, whatever, with, with the tractor and forks. Down the road they go, they bring back the empty when it's empty, and we do it again. Mm -hmm. You know, the the number of people in my area that don't know what a cord of wood is, is ridiculous. So by doing the totes, I get a lot of customers, hey, how much for one of them totes of wood? Well, they know exactly what it is. They know, they drive by here and see them. Mm -hmm. you know and i i i'm one of them you know the the 275 gallon totes you know you mound the heck out of them and you're going to be plus or minus a quarter of a cord tossed in mm -hmm. you know the i i do have a fair amount of 330 totes as well you know i mound the heck out of those and that's pretty close to a third well then i also do i take the tote liners the 330 liners at least I'll cut them in half, you know? So I got the top half and the bottom half mm -hmm. filler full of wood. There's a sixth of a cord. Okay. Well, that, that half a tote, you know, you can toss that. If you halfway stack it, that'll fit in the back of just about any small sport utility. Well, I actually fit in the trunk of a, you know, Oh five, Oh six, Oh seven Impala, you know? Wow. So, I mean, that that size is really really popular with a lot of my campers that are going camping for the weekend because that's you know a weekend's worth of campfire wood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so it, it it's it's not so much that I focus on one specific volume, so to speak. You know, you get on my website and I think uh, we've been updating stuff again, so I'm not exactly sure what's actually on there right this second, but. You get on my website, you can order a half a cord, you can order a full cord, you can order, I think we, we're, it's either on there now or we were going to add cord and a half and two cord as options too, because my, my bigger truck will haul two full cord in a single trip, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that full cord or two full cord for a lot of my heating customers, you know, they get a lot of them, they'll get a load in October when it starts cooling off and then they'll get another load in typically right after Christmas sometime for the second half of the winter, or they'll get, you know, two loads or whatever in October. And then they got their winter's worth, you know, because when I say heating customers, I'm not, I'm not supplying people that their primary heat is wood very often. 
Okay. You know, I, I'm I'm talking supplemental heating type customers. You know, they they're they're burning in a fireplace, insert, small stove, what have you, just for a little extra heat. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, I'll I'll sell wood in whatever volume somebody wants to buy it, but it still all boils down to basically a per cord pricing. I hear you, Phil. Um, that's you made a good point of the totes. Um, obviously I'm not on the scale that you're at, but when I do sell bulk wood, that's how I usually sell it. Because like you said, people don't know what a cord is or the volume of it. And, but they can visualize it and literally see what a cage looks like and how much wood is in there. Exactly. Uh, so what I could put, 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 put one in, in, in my, in my, in my, in my truck and fill it full of wood and deliver it. And they, they get that, but having prices where half a cord, a full cord, two cords, they don't, if they're not, not in and around firewood, they don't, they don't get how much wood that is. It's just safer on, on both their ends. So, um, and that, that way too, I don't get where, well, this is not a third of a cord. This is not, not a full cord and say that I, I gave them less wood than what they what they, what they ordered. It's this is the cage. This is what you're getting, and there's never been like, this is not what I ordered type thing. But um, yeah. Well, and and you know, talking about what a cord of wood is and whatnot and what they ordered. You know, most states the legal unit of measure for firewood is strictly a cord. You know. Mm-hmm. That's your 120, 128 cubic foot stacked. Now, there's there's always been people that look to utilize that definition one way or the other. Um, with with myself being a state certified firewood producer, I've learned a lot of this stuff directly from the people at the state that, you know, are supposed to be enforcing these rules. And I hear people, oh, it's 128 cubic foot tightly stacked. No, it's 128 cubic foot stacked, period. That's it. And I asked my inspector, oh, this was early this last spring at one point. I asked her, I said, okay, so I, I deliver a quart of wood to somebody. They file a grievance with the state of Wisconsin Department of Weights and Measures, blah, 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 that I shorted them on a quarter wood. I said, how's that work? And they said, well, here's how it works. Whether it's dumped in a pile or the customer stacked it or you stacked it, we will send a person out there, a third party out there, to stack the wood and measure it. And she says, the guy we've got in this area that goes out there and does it, He's of the old rule of thumb. You stack your wood pile for so a squirrel can run through it, but the house cat chasing them can't. Okay. You know, so I mean, when you're stacking wood to season, you want some airflow through it, so you're going to have airspace in it. Mm-hmm. And she said, the last time he went out and stacked a pile that the people were complaining about, they had it stacked so damn tight. She said she don't even remember who in the heck the supplier was, but they stacked it so dang tight, and that stuff was so wet when they stacked it, the sap boiling out of the wood was gluing pieces back together. Really? So they claimed they were shorted like three or four cubic foot, you know, not nothing substantial. By the time the, the independent guy from the state stacked it all, they were almost 15 cubic foot over. Because they had it stacked that flipping tight, Jeez. but you know it, it's it's it just boils down to the difference between legal unit of measure for sales versus common usage. You know, you go to the you go to your favorite restaurant, you know a large soda is going to be bigger than a small soda. Mm-hmm. You go to a different restaurant, you don't know if their large soda is the same size as the large soda at your favorite place. Mm-hmm. But you go to the gas station and get a 32 ounce fountain drink. It don't matter which gas station you go to. That's going to be a 32 ounce fountain drink. Yeah. 
you know, because large and small are common usage. Ounces is a legal unit of measure for certain things. Um, gotcha. Yeah. And educating a customer is never a bad thing. You know, educating a user is tough. Educating a customer always comes back to help you. You know, the the difference between a customer and a user, you know, I see it all the time. Your Your users are always looking for the cheapest product. They're not necessarily mindful of quality or quantity or what have you. They're looking for whoever's the cheapest. And they might be your customer for a year. Chances are they're not coming back the next year. Mm. Now, a customer, they're going to put value on things like quality and customer service and, you know, an honest quantity of wood. Those are the ones you actually want. You don't want the users. You want the customers. And for most guys, that takes years to build up a good customer base. Mm Mm-hmm. I've got some customers now that have been with me for, oh, I've got a couple of guys have been with me now close to 10 years. Really? Because they come back to you because not necessarily of your prices, but because you're, they know that they, that they can come to you for firewood and it's quality. Like your, your quality standards are at a level that they don't fluctuate. Like you're going to sell a good product to them, I assume, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, my prices over the years, I mean, this is the first year I've actually looked at not having a price increase. This is the first year I've looked at that in probably the last six or seven. Otherwise, mm-hmm. every year there's been a small price increase. Um, mm-hmm. The The customers that have been with me long term know when they call me for their annual order or whatever. They know they're going to get exactly what they ordered or a little extra. Normally it's Mm -hmm. a little extra. They, they know I'm going to show up when, when we schedule for delivery. You know, I, I schedule my deliveries in in the fall of the year. There's a lot of times I'll run three, four loads, three or four different deliveries in the same day. Well, Mm -hmm. my first two deliveries of the day, I normally schedule a half hour delivery window. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to have my first delivery, you know, if it's, if it's close to the house, I'll have my first delivery somewhere eight, eight thirty in the morning, you know, and then of course, depending on travel time, whatnot, but then like my afternoon deliveries, I'll schedule those for an hour delivery window just in case something happens. You know, you get five minutes behind on the first one, you get 15 minutes behind on a second one. Well, by the time you get to your third or fourth delivery, you might be running 45 minutes to an hour behind. So by having that, that fairly tight, but still flexible delivery window, these people aren't sitting around waiting on me all day. You know, I'm not the cable mm-hmm. company. I'm not going to tell somebody I'll be there between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and expect you to sit around half the week waiting on me. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, I mean, the, the loggers I buy from, you know, we've developed a relationship that they've come to the, you know, they, they're of the understanding. Yes, we will, you know, we'll plan for this window, but I mean, all the way down to the truck drivers, they've all got my cell phone number. So if something comes up, they can call me, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, I had a logger two years ago, new guy I was trying out, you know, he was another local guy. I figured what the heck, we'll give him a shot. We'll see what is, what he brings me. Well, we talked back and forth and I told him, I says, well, let's go ahead and go with a load of this. Well, he, instead of bringing me a load of this, he brought me a load of that. Hmm. Showed up, showed up a day late, a full day late, no call, nothing that he wasn't coming the day before. Well, the driver gets here and I was about ready to pull out of the driveway with the delivery and the driver, well, where do you want it? He says, well, I'll dump it off over there. I'll go get you. I'll, I'll go get you your money. Well, when do you want the next load? And I says, there isn't a next load. Well, why not? I says, well, 
maybe if you would have called me yesterday that you weren't coming, maybe there would have been a next load. Mm -hmm. But I go, I, I've got a business around here. You know, I've got places to be. I've got things to do. And you guys think I should wait for you when I'm buying something from you? That's not how this works. Mm -hmm, if if mm -hmm. you're the one selling, you better not make your customer sit and wait. You know, now granted, yeah, there are times, you know, something comes up, you know, so I get running behind or whatever. It don't take long to pick up a phone. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do a fair amount of summer sales on Facebook Marketplace. Well, there's the whole text chain right there. Mm -hmm. Drop Drop them a message. Hey, I'm running late. You want me to keep coming or do you want me to reschedule? You know, what have you, you know, yeah. it, it, firewood is just as much about the service as it is the product. I want to do an episode on my channel about that topic. Firewood as a service versus the product and where they are different and where they are very similar. I think that it's, I think that would be a good subject to touch upon and um oh and we could do back, a whole, we, we we could do a two-hour yeah, episode just on that i agree with you phil for sure and i think that what you mentioned um is a trend i think in the community either on social media or on youtube that um to to the, the uh, uh to be to be able to be transparent with your your, your customers and to be communicative to, to let them know, hey, so we're scheduling on, on a Tuesday afternoon at noon, and then I like to make sure that I text them or call them before I'm on my way to give them an ETA uh, type thing. I'd rather be overly communicative than under, to make sure that they're almost annoyed by me letting <laughs> them know via text and messenger that about the wood, about the stack, I'll show them a picture of it, make sure that they know what they're getting um, versus silence. And I show up out of the blue Tuesday at one o'clock and they're like, you were late or uh, where this come from? Like that uh, type thing. That, that, uh, it, that, 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 is be, yeah. that is definitely another episode for future uh, dates. So stay tuned and wait for us to ramble on about customer service. There you go. I think, I think, so if anyone watching wants to have Phil on again, let us know. I, there's definitely several subjects that um, he and I can, can cover. Um, we, 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 we could start a, a, a separate podcast during the week, you know, a, a, a Tuesday night or something, you know, uh, talk, talk and shop or talk and trash or whatever. L yeah. Listen to Phil ramble on about how, how, how he uh, <laughs> spends his days. You know, that's it, funny. It, it, well, and that's the kind of stuff, you know, my YouTube channel, I mentioned earlier, you know, like I said, I got one video on there so far for, for years. I want to do avoid YouTube just because there is so much stuff on YouTube that I just, I, I, I look at it and I go, how in the hell, but you know, I get it. You know, you want to do YouTube videos of whatever you're doing, go for it, have fun. But, you know, understand that, okay, are you making firewood or are you making videos, you know? And I, I decided on, you know, I've had enough guys over the years hounding me. They go, when are you going to have your own YouTube channel? When are you going to have your own channel? When are you going to have your own channel? And it's like, you know what? Screw it. So, oh, what the heck was that? Back in, I think it was March or early April or whatever, I, I set one up, you know. Um, at Phil's Firewood WI, that's my YouTube channel. Phil's Firewood WI dot com is my website. You know, go ahead, check it out. Like I said, the YouTube channel is one two and a half minute long video so far, but that's going to be my focus on my channel is more of the more of the business side of things. You know, it's not going to be it's not going to be something you're going to sit and watch to unwind at the end of the day. It's hopefully going to be a channel. You, you sit and learn something, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying I have it all figured out. Lord knows I ain't got it all figured out. I got enough figured out 
so far, I still got all 10 fingers, all 10 toes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I ain't dropped a tree on myself. But, you know, there, there's a lot of things I've learned kind of the hard way. And, I mean, yeah, I've come across a few channels here and there that that touch on a little more of the business side of things. But so far, what little bit I've come across, it, it's it's from a manufacturer or from a distributor. It's, yes, it's touching on the business stuff, but they're trying to show you how their product would fit into your business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and for certain things, it just doesn't work. You know, I, I know... One of the bigger groups that I've been banned from, the guy was always pushing them bulk bags for firewood, you know, the, the super sacks and whatnot. Well, fine and dandy, super sacks work great in certain conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, for you guys out there, you know, I, I don't know how far from the coast you are out there in the wonderful Pacific Northwest. You know, if you're in, in, in a rainy climate like that, I don't see how those bags would work. You know, bagging up the wood after it's dry, they probably work great, but you're not going to put green wood in them bags, set it out in the rain no. 11 and a half months out of the year. You know what you're going to have? Mm -hmm. You're going to have a super sack full of mushrooms. I, yes. I'm, I'm literally know. 10 minutes from, 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 from salt water. So, yeah, definitely not, mm -hmm. not, not going to dry out here. No. <laughs> you know, the, you know, and you being in that climate, you know, 90% of the stuff I do, there ain't no way in the world it'd work for you. Yeah. You know, and so, I mean, that's my, my goal with my channel is to be more, more business minded, you know, and I'm hoping to have other like-minded commercial firewood guys, you know, weigh in on you know, the differences between the climates, you know, as I start doing more consulting and getting out and traveling more, you know, I'm going to have more content that's based on, okay, this is what so-and-so is trying in Maine, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Texas, Missouri, you know, I had a guy a couple of years ago, nice enough guy, he's in Kansas. And he's like, well, how do I get some of my loads of logs delivered to me? And I says, well, look around. I says, how many trees are, are around you? You're in Kansas. And he says, well, he says, basically, it's farm fields as far as I can see. And I go, I hate to tell you this. Chances are you're not going to have a local logging outfit if you live in the middle of wheat fields in Kansas. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that's all stuff that I'm hoping to kind of touch on more in depth, you know, mm -hmm. some of my episodes are going to be nice little short videos, you know, as I'm starting to go to trade shows a little more often and whatnot, you know, Oh, look at this cool toy from whoever, you know, but it, it I've, I've always, I was fortunate enough growing up. I had some pretty decent mentors. Fortunately, I also had some that were really, really good at playing devil's advocate. You know, I'd come up with an idea and they would tell me every which way that it was wrong or not going to work. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's something I think there's a, I think there's a lack of a lacking and a want for that in the firewood world. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping to try to, you know, help fill some of that void. You know, cool. if, if, if you were looking for a specific advice to your site, I'd love to give you some help. Don't have a clue other than I know, you know, pine is not as big of a no-no out there as it is around here. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, stay tuned for, for Phil's channel. That's going to be, um, budding and, and growing soon. Um, I, I think I've got all the seven or eight subscribers at this point. Well, hopefully with this episode, it'll be, it'll be more than that soon, um, for sure. For what I like about the firewood community is the camaraderie. And most of us are pretty solid folk. And when you need advice or need help, 
come on by, swing by, split some wood for for a bit, have a beer, whatever. Um, but there, but there are the outliers who are who are selfish and and arrogant and just I don't know. They have I, this thing about them. But most of us are, are I, pretty chill I, I, people. I've been in this world long enough, you know. The the well, the world as a whole, plus the firewood industry, you know, for the most part, the people that are, you know, just absolutely miserable to be around. They typically don't last real long. You know, you're you've got to be you've got to be personable to make a go of it. You know, mm-hmm. I I had a producer. Oh, what was that? He's his yard was eh, forty miles from me, give or take. And he was tucked off on a back road. You know, and backside of a golf course high-end condos all over the place very very high-end market well he drank the kool-aid he bought the sixty thousand dollar kiln direct kiln he bought the the big fancy multi-tech processor the tumblers the bags the whole nine yards so i mean he had her made you know he had all the equipment he had all the market he could have ever wanted right out his back door. Mm-hmm. The guy was absolutely miserable. He hmm. was a miserable human being to be around. You know, he pissed off the loggers so he couldn't get wood. He pissed off customers. He was going around writing false reviews for other firewood guys on Google and stuff. What? It's like, dude... How miserable of a life do you have? Wow. You know, and there was no reason for it. I mean, now he's closed up shop and gone. But, I mean, he he was one of those people. It's like, dude, go ahead and keep running your mouth. Keep being a miserable little person. And we'll see who's still in this game in five years. Mm-hmm. Needless to say, here I am. I have no idea right? what he's doing now. <laughs> I think, I mean, to, to to sell firewood at whatever scale, I think you have to have a level of customer service. And it's not like you're going to have to be buddy, buddy, best friends with each one of your customers, but to have a rapport. Um, well, and that, if you, that goes go ahead. That should go without saying firewood at the mm-hmm. end of the day, it is retail. Yes. You are selling a product to a customer. Mm-hmm. If you don't have good customer service or don't want to be in retail, don't get into firewood. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I, 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 I heard years ago, and I don't even remember where I heard it, but I heard years ago, a customer will become a friend before a friend will become a customer. And it is very like true. Mm-hmm. Very, very few of the friends I've had over the years have ever bought wood from me. I have customers on the other hand, you know, like in the spring of the year, there's a lot of maple syrup gets, gets collected and cooked down around me. We got, got pretty good sugar maples around Wisconsin. I've got guys in the spring of the year, they come and they pick up a a cord, two cord, whatever, a firewood to cook their maple syrup. Well, they bring me a bottle of syrup or they bring me a jar of jelly or jam or um, fall of the year. I got some guys who come get, smoker woods from me to to smoke their their venison summer sausage or their their bear meat or whatever well they drop off you know a stick of summer sausage or a bear roast or whatever you know they have at this point they've become friends Mm -hmm. you know and it's about treating your customer the way you want to be treated you know you're you know you want to you want to do business with somebody that values your, your business, you yeah. know? So it, it's, and that, that's typically not an issue for a lot of guys. You know, a lot of guys get that, you know, you've got to be personal, personable. You've got to be sociable. You've got to be approachable, but it's just kind of that. Okay. I, there, there's a line there. You can't sit and chit chat with somebody all day over a pickup load of firewood. You're never going to get anything done. You know, 
so I mean, you've got to figure out where that happy medium is. You know, for me, mm-hmm. I, I've started now. Um, back in April was my first uh, public open house where I invited general public, firewood producers, whoever, come on out and tour the operation. That day was not intended to be. I mean, I was hoping to make some sales that day. Obviously, I'm in business. You know, that's the point. Mm-hmm. Make make sales. Yeah. But the the whole goal of that day was not sales. It was educating customers, getting to meet people, talking wood, talking, you know, what have you. Um, uh, Bob Nelson from Wolf Ridge actually, you know, took a lot of pictures, some video, whatnot. Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Whiskey River up in Ironwood. I think he's been on your podcast. Uh, Brandon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Brandon, you know, we did, did some stuff with him that afternoon. You know, he did a, a video on my kiln. Um, him and Bob did a video with, with my splitter and my conveyor and stuff, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I've pretty much always got an open door here. You know, somebody wants to come out and learn about it, what have you come on out. You know, mm-hmm. if it's if it's late in the evening, well, we'll have a have a beverage or two. If it's early in the morning, I might share my coffee. That's a big <laughs> mite on the sharing coffee, by the way. <laughs> That's funny. If you take the That's last funny. cup, you better make the next pot. Right? Exactly. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, on the note, yeah, like my my dad asked me, I think it was last year, whether it was okay that they don't buy firewood from me. And I had a smile and laugh, like, That's fine, Dad. Like you don't need to buy because because he wants cheap firewood and I don't sell cheap firewood. I, I sell premium product and I don't think that he, that, that he would want to buy or spend that much money on just firewood. So I was like, that's fine. That you don't need to buy firewood for me. That, that That's totally cool. But, uh, thank you, Phil, for, 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 for being on. Is there anything that you want to say before we sign off? Anything that's lacking on, on, uh, on, on YouTube or anything that you want to share with us? The, the the biggest thing, I think, if I'm going to sum it all up into one final bullet point is, you know, be be realistic and honest with yourself. You know, what what do you want to do with your firewood? Are you are you happy being a hobby guy? If so, be a hobby guy. You know, are you looking to grow? Well, then then you need to find somebody out there that's at that level you want to grow to, you know, um, you want to use fire firewood as content for YouTube videos, have at her. There's plenty of guys out there. You know, I'm sure half the reason they do firewood is to make videos out of it. You know, be honest with yourself on what you're looking to do with it. Um, you know, are there days I look back and I go, God, I should have stayed at 50 quarter a year. God. Yeah. I mean, 50 quart a year, I could do that with a half ton pickup, a $600 chainsaw and a $1,500 tractor supply splitter. You know, I wouldn't need thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars in overhead. You know, just be, be honest with yourself about it. You know, I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions, but be realistic. You know, you know, it's, it's, it's easy making firewood. Anybody can make firewood. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's it's at what point do you want to get to, and what makes sense to get from A to B. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's that's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell. You know, be be realistic, be honest with yourself, and you know, go for it. Hell, like years it. ago, I wanted to be an adult film star, but obviously, I ain't got the face <laughs> for that. I hear you're saying, buddy. I hear you're saying that's funny. That's funny. Well, let us know, folks, if you want Phil back on again. Uh, a wealth of knowledge, either um, to share with us, and for sure, as he posts more on his channel, uh, tune in on on his on his channel too on YouTube. I uh, want to thank Phil for for his time to just go say hi or say goodbye, Phil. Hey, we'll see you next time. All right, folks. Well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate it. If you want to be on the podcast, let me know. I uh, hope that you enjoyed this episode. I, I, I know I did. Um, so it's good stuff out there. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Until next time, cheers.